live like this for quite some time. So it's really nice and very, very warming to see all of you all here. We want to see as many of you all as possible actually in the flesh. And we're doing an Instosin meet and greet on the 17th of September. And we really, really hope you all will come there and support us. Uh, we put out donor passes. We put this up on our Instosin Instagram page. We put this up on our Instosin website. So we're really trying to raise uh, some funds for more work to be done so we can bring better programming to you in the future. We have a lovely evening planned with dinner. Uh, I'm going to bore you to tears for some time. And there's going to be an amazing display and demonstration of uh, Adivasi music with one of our teachers who's going to put that forward for us. And we're going to have a lot of our merchandise available also on that day, physically over there for people to place orders and things like that. So we're really, really looking forward uh, to as many of you all as possible coming over, buying donor passes and becoming part of this event of the 17th. So I will ask uh, uh, Yogini to share the event on WhatsApp group where you all have all signed up so that you all know which event I'm talking about. Uh, at Instruction, as you know, since the lockdown started from the month of April 2020 itself, we've been doing some awesome programming. We've had over 200 certificate, co uh, 200 certificate courses or 180 certificate courses or something like that that we've run through. We've started a number of diplomas. Uh, we have one in literature, we have one in geology, we have one in archaeology, and we now have one in Buddhist studies. So uh, we've been trying to make sure that we bring good, responsible education uh, to as many people as possible uh, through the online medium. So I thought today that I'd really talk to you about some of the some of the regular and repetitive problems that come up when uh, we are teaching and how these problems, despite being refuted by the top names in their fields, do not seem to go away at all. So, you know, right on top of my list is right from my very, very early days when I was teaching physically from 2010-11 at uh, the Center for Extramural Studies, I would have students regularly asking me, Sir, isn't it true that Taj Mahal is actually a Shiva temple? And I kept wondering how people could be so gullible. And then I realized that the works of people who have written bad history, like P.N. Oak and Stephen Knapp, are far more exciting than most of the historians that we have, who tend to be uh, more academic and much on the drier side. And they don't talk about controversy. And in this land of Hollywood, where Mithun can hide behind a cycle, and people are shooting at him. Uh, it's, you know, dry, boring stuff about who did what to whom really doesn't cut the eyes. So every single year, I have had at least one student ask me this question. And I thought that, you know, that was a burning question that needed to be answered about whether there was a Shiva temple, which we are kind of passing off as the Taj Mahal today. Um, it isn't, by the way, just for the record. But in 2018-19, I was surprised to find that the Taj Mahal now had a cousin, a close cousin in Delhi, and this was the Qutub Minar. But I was asked, sir, but Qutub Minar is really built by Prithviraj Chavan, no? And I was kind of blown away because the entire Qutub Minar is completely covered in Islamic calligraphy. And every single floor of the Qutub Minar has embedded above the doorway an inscription by various different rulers telling us that they built those doorways. So how the Qutub Minar could be a victory pillar of Prithviraj Chauhan, I haven't the faintest, foggiest notion. But what has happened over the years is that so many of these things have been misrepresented to the public in general. We regularly have people telling us, you know, during Ram Rajya 80,000 years ago, and I'm thinking that 80,000 years ago, we were in the middle Paleolithic phase. We were hunter-gatherers. And there was definitely no epic cities, palaces kind of thing going on around us. I'm regularly told by Jains about how 120,000 years ago, uh, Rishabh Nath, the first Vithankara, actually preached to the Jains. And then I'm thinking that this is a, a phenomenon that goes beyond the early middle Paleolithic in India and probably goes into the late upper Paleolithic when Homo erectus was on the landscape. So... There is a problem of faith and fact 
And whilst you can believe what you want to believe as far as, well, your faith is concerned, if it's that important to you, you must also understand that these things need to be backed very, very strongly and solidly with good data. So the Rig Veda is put up way somewhere at 40,000 years ago or at 10,000 years ago, very arbitrarily. When we know that we were going through the Neolithic phases and the Chalcolithic phases, and it is not possible for the Rig Veda to have been amongst us at that time, because the events described and the landscape described in the Rig Veda doesn't match these times. But we like to have great antiquity to our epics. We like to have great antiquity to our texts. I have regularly been told that it is Chandragupta of the Gupta dynasty, who's there in the third century BC. And it's actually Chandragupta Maurya was probably somewhere around 1000 BC. But I know for a matter of fact that it's not possible because we have Chandragupta's son actually talking about the Greek rulers in that region. We have the Greek rulers surrounding India talking about uh, Bindusara. We have Ashoka Maurya specifically in his inscriptions listing four different Greek rulers. You know, so uh, it is impossible for us to then, we would have to take the whole of Greek history back that far. But despite all of this, this regularly keeps coming up. Whilst it was not of epidemic status before social media became what it is, thanks to the Academy of Facebook and the University of WhatsApp, as I like to call it, there are great WhatsApp groups which are continuously plugging this kind of drivel in the name of history. And the logic is that if, you know, 500 people are saying that the Taj Mahal is actually a Shiva temple called the Tejo Mahalaya, then it's got to be 500 people can't be wrong or 5,000 people can be wrong. And I would like to tell you that 50,000 people can also be wrong if the data that they're quoting is wrong, is spurious, and is manufactured. So it's very, very important for us to consume our history from sources that are solid, to go to places where we get really solid sources who tell us about the archaeology and history of India. And there is tons and tons of work done by archaeologists and historians. So there is absolutely no need at all for us to go to these charlatans and listen to this kind of nonsense. That said, this kind of epidemic now of pseudo history is causing more damage to India than ever before. Indian academics are now the butt of jokes abroad because of this kind of belief system that has been put into place by these groups. I don't know what the agendas are for this because it really makes no sense to have the Rig Veda at 15,000 years or uh, for the Jains to have uh, Rishabh Nath at 120,000 years ago and so on and so forth. But it is damaging to India, Indian culture and Indian history to see this taking place. Adding to this is the whole fact that the government that we have in the sector today firmly believes that history has been badly written has been miswritten and needs to be rewritten. Now, there is absolutely no problem with revising history. Absolutely no problem at all. In fact, all good historians will tell you that history needs to be periodically revised. Whether you like it or not, from time to time, historians have to look at the data that has been generated since history was last written about A, B, C, or D, and they need to rewrite this history. And that is very, very much in keeping with scientific traditions. At the same time, twisting history to serve your own purpose or to make party A or party B happy, whichever that party might be, is absolutely and completely wrong and is something that we cannot do. So it is a shame if there are any people who call themselves historians who write this revisionistic kind of history because then this history is routinely taught to students. I'll give you two simple examples which have nothing to do with any government present or future, but which have just to do with the people who write textbooks. There was a time when the Maharashtra State textbook told us that the kingdom of Shivaji Maharaj was extended all the way to Muscat and Oman by Kanoji Hangre. Now to think that Muscat and Oman were part of the Maharashtra-based kingdom of Shivaji Maharaj is ridiculous. It is doing an insult to Shivaji Maharaj. It is not glorifying his empire in any way because we know it was not. If you were to say that there is some evidence for a raid 
I would at least accept that. But we know that we had a white water navy, not a blue water navy. And that even that kind of a raid to Oman and Muscat would be way into the realm of conjecture. I remember very categorically teaching uh, the Bachelors in Heritage Management in 2003 and to 2005 at uh, the KC College. And because we were going through Indian history as one of our verticals, I'd asked all the students to do presentations on different bits, thinking it would be easy on me. And in the post-lunch session in the auditorium with the AC on, and I'm, I was feeling a little happy in the darkness as students were doing presentations, trying to catch, you know, a quick 40 winks. And one of the students said that the introduction of the beef and pork fat greased cartridges was a deep-rooted conspiracy on the part of the British Empire to convert the standing Indian army to Christianity. And it kind of knocked me out of my song and said, I said, excuse me, what did you just say? And she repeated herself. And I said, are you nuts? Are you absolutely nuts? I mean, what would the British have done with all these newly converted, minted uh, Christians in India? If there was any, any group of colonizers who did not actively proselytize, it was the Anglican British. If you'd said something like this about the Portuguese, I would completely accept that it was very feasible. So I said, are you, are you mad to her? And she picked up the 11 standard textbook published by the government of Maharashtra for the HSC course and said, sir, it says so in this line over there. And I was flabbergasted. I said, what does your common sense say? What does your common sense say about this? So there's a lot of history that is badly written. There's a lot of history that needs to be revised in our textbooks. And there's a lot of work that needs to be done. Let's do this in as sincere a manner as possible and not to push one agenda or the other. And that is why we need to periodically revisit and rewrite history. So saying this, I'd like to come to archeology, span which is essentially my forte and talk to you all about archeology. span So what are the things happening in archeology span today? What are the changes taking place? Most good archeological research takes about 20 years from excavation to reaching a place where it might find a small space in a textbook in school or college. But in the meantime, archeologists are keeping on digging up new stuff time and again, time and again, and time and again, and periodically pulling up new things out of the ground and changing our understanding of things. We already know that we now have a lower Paleolithic site in the Shivalik Hills called Masol, which dates to roughly 2.6 million years ago. And that is earlier than the earliest known out of Africa event, which means that the out of Africa events have not been dated early enough in Africa and that archaeologists in Africa need to go back to the books. They need to go back to the field and they need to look for this evidence for the first time. We have some amazing work that Ravi Kurisetar and his team have been doing at Jwalapuram and telling us that it's Homo sapiens who actually bring middle paralytic tools to us somewhere around 75 to 80,000 years ago into India. And that the Homo sapiens like Homo erectus, which Dr. Shanti Papu put on the map of India in 2000, 2001, are actually first going east before they're going west into Europe, which is something that most European prehistorians find very, very difficult to stomach, but the data is incontroversible. So the Middle Paleolithic is also radically changing in our minds. There is a phenomenal young archeologist called Mr. Blinkhorn, who now I think should have been awarded his PhD by now. Blinkhorn has been working on the other side of the Aravalis, or the wrong side of the Aravalis, as we jokingly call it, where there is a desert. But there have been wet phases when the Luni River flowed westwards from the Aravalis. It still does today in the monsoon, but it dries up very fast. It only carries water during very heavy rainfall periods. But there were wetter periods, and he's been doing some absolutely gorgeous work and finding and dating middle periodic sites in this region to 60,000 and plus years ago with some amazing analysis of the kind of tools that they're bringing in and showing parallels with Africa and not with Europe. Once again, reinforcing in our minds the fact that it is the out of Africa homo sapiens who are coming this way, not to India as such. They don't have India on their minds. 
but they're going eastwards because it is much more hospitable than westwards where we have the Neanderthals, cold weather adapting to an enormous extent in Europe at this time, because it's the time of the ice ages. We have a phenomenal new site called Dhaba. And the site of Dhaba is completely changing our view of the upper Paleolithic period as we call it. For years and years, Indian archeologists have struggled with the concept of an upper Paleolithic, which was first established in Europe because that is where people worked first. But when we work in India in the time period that covers the upper Paleolithic, we find very different tools, just because the kind of raw material required to make the tools that the Europeans made does not exist in the Indian subcontinent. But this doesn't mean that we are not culturally evolving into this direction. So for a long time, we've been saying that the chronology of Europe and the typology of Europe needs to be put aside and a new chronology and typology and understanding of periods needs to be created in India. For the first time at Thabha, we have what we would call usually a Mesolithic occupation, which is post the Upper Paralithic, post the Ice Age, at a date as early as 40,000 BC. So what we are saying now is that in India, there is no Upper Paleolithic and Mesolithic separately, but we have evolved into a Mesolithic toolkit much, much earlier than anywhere else, perhaps, that we know of till this date. This is just an adaptation. We don't have to look at any superiority angle over here. But it's phenomenal to see the direction human material culture is taking in India as opposed to what it is being made out as and what it is in the rest of the world. So the Africans have already started using the terms early Stone Age, Middle Stone Age, and Late Stone Age, and not Lower Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic, and Upper Paleolithic. It's time we in India now reassess the data that we have from sites like Masol and Jwalapuram and Atrampakam, and look at the fact that we have a very, very different adaptation taking place here than elsewhere. I've done an entire series on revisiting prehistory where I've talked about them, and I think the lectures are up on our Instagram website if you'd like to hear and see what I have to say about that. There's a lot of interesting work going on in the Neolithic period, a period we know very little about in India. The latest news out this week is that Neolithic researchers in the United Kingdom have actually established that the first farmers in UK were not making bread out of their grains, but were making porridges out of their grains. Something that we suspected for a long time, but had no proof of. For the first time, Neolithic pottery is being very carefully analyzed by biochemists who are looking at the remnants of food that was cooked in these pots. And we now have evidence of cereals being boiled into porridges for the first time to say, yes, this is what is being done. And we need to automatically look at this as a possible way of evolution of our diet during this early Neolithic Chalcolithic phase in India as well. You cannot overlook the congees of Southern India and of Eastern India. You cannot overlook the Ragi Mudde of Karnataka and think that everybody is only making roti of some sort or breads of some sort. So there are other possibilities and bread could have been a much later entrant into the game than we otherwise think. So these are once again things that we need to do. Uh, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat and I'll be very, very happy to take them. I'm not going to go on beyond 8.45 or so with my talk, hopefully. And I'll be very, very happy to take these with you. So the Harappans have been giving us some amazing data. And this is part of the new archaeology wave that is going on, where technology, where various different sciences are supporting archaeology to a large extent. So the biochemical work first done on the what we call the proto curry from the Harappan sites, which is a Bengan curry, okay, which is a Bengan dish made with mustard oil, with or sesame oil, and with garlic and haldi and ginger. We're now looking at much, much more than this. Uh, Prabhu Chirwalkar excavated the site of Kanmer, and knowing now that we can derive this kind of data from pottery, did not wash his potsherds in the field brought them back so that the biochem teams could select that which they wanted, which would give the best chances of giving some kind of food-based data. And much to his amazing surprise, 
he now has milk processing for the first time in the Indian subcontinent as early as the mature Harappan period. So that tells us that somewhere between 2600 and 1900 BC in the Kutch and Gujarat regions, which are to a large extent the milk banks of India, what we know very categorically today is that we were making dahi, we were probably making paneer and other things out of milk and not just consuming milk as a liquid. You'll probably say, what is the big deal about making dahi? It's not the big deal about making dahi. It is the proof that we were making dahi because dahi is much easier to digest than milk is. Because the lactic bacteria have done half our job by partially digesting the milk. So the kind of data that is coming out like this is completely blowing our minds and sending us back to the drawing board. It's not that this hasn't happened before. Way back in 1994, I remember at the World Archaeological Congress 3, which was held in Delhi, I was a young kid at that time, and there was a paper listed called Harappan Soap, Harappan Detergent and Shampoo. And I thought this was some kind of crackpot presenting a paper, and I had to listen to this madman and went there. And much to my surprise, the paper was presented by one of the great archaeobotanists of India, K.S. Saraswat, who worked with the Birbal Sahani Institute of Paleobotany. And what he had analyzed were the remnants of a mass of dried fruits that were on top of a house in the Harappan city of Banavali, which got fire and collapsed. So it was leveled and a new house was built on top of it. But the remnants of the burnt charred house were underneath, which meant, of course, we could date that precisely. And when he carefully studied this biomass and teased apart the various constituents of the biomass, he identified three different kinds of fruits, avla, shikakai, and rita. And this is what we use in Ayurvedic preparations to make shampoo and soap to wash our silks and things like that. And this rita was very interesting because the rita that we use today is actually a Chinese variant that has come over from China to us much earlier. Okay, probably sometime in the historical period through trade. But the Rita that he found was a very, very small fruit, a very tiny fruit that today is only found in limited jungles in southern India, telling us that at one time there was a local Rita that was being used. And of course, when an easier to use larger fruit appeared, we automatically switch to that. So this kind of data has been coming to us from early on. It sadly doesn't make it to textbooks. It doesn't make it to the press. And in 1994, there was no social media to put it up on. But today, thanks to social media, a lot of the latest discoveries being made by our archaeologists and scientists are making it immediately to the news, sometimes detrimentally. One of the big problems that we've had is that we had a huge spate of articles and counter articles about the discovery of DNA at the Harappan site of Rakigadi, which is being excavated by Professor Vasan Shinde, ex-director of the Deccan College. Now, the first thing you need to understand is one is not a set. One can be a subset, but one finding of DNA is number one, not a set. And you cannot say anything about India or the people of India or the ethnicity of the Harappans from one example. But what is most important about this and which is not being tom tommed is, oh my God, four and a half thousand year old DNA has been recovered in India, which till now we thought was impossible. And that if we've recovered one, we can carefully start looking for more and more DNA in the kind of burials that we get across the Indian subcontinent and get a far better idea of the people, their adaptations, their limitations, so on and so forth. So this is very, very important for us and very, very important as a breakthrough in science. The genome of that lady has been studied and you can, you know, interpret it one way or the other, but that's one individual, okay? My ancestors came from Persia. I'm sure there is some leftover Persian DNA in me. If I was the only person whose DNA was analyzed today, you would say that all Indians were of Persian origin, which is wrong. So one is not a set. We need a couple of hundred samples before we can say anything with any credibility. But now we've opened the doors to say, that that data can be generated. And that is what we should be celebrating and not the supposed ethnicity of all the Harappans from one single sample. 
So these are things that we need to look at very, very seriously. And we need to start putting this amazing data together. For a long time after the discovery of the Harappans, we talked about a dark age in India between the Harappans and the rise of the second urbanization somewhere in the sixth century BC. Today, we've realized that the second urbanization actually begins to start off in the eighth, seventh, eighth century BC, and that it really takes solid root by the end of the seventh century BC. We also found out that there are lots and lots of late Harappan cultures. There is a massive movement, the Saraswati dries up, and there is a massive movement from the Indus Saraswati river systems into the east. All the late Harappan sites are clustered either in Haryana or in Gujarat. And for the first time, these enigmatic people that we called the copper hoard people, where we just found large clumps of copper objects, swords, spearheads, harpoons, axes, and funny anthropomorphic figures, and nothing else with them. For the first time, we have now absolute evidence. We had a little bit of evidence from a site called Saipai, where we had something called the OCP or the ochre colored pottery, with which we found a short antenna sword. But now we have an entire graveyard of the elite at a site called Sonoli. We have tons of OCP ceramic, and we have large numbers of copper hoard uh, weapons with them, telling us once and for all that the copper hoard people are the OCP. And what is very interesting for us is that they're one of the big Bronze Age players, late Bronze Age players into the Ganga Yamuna Doab and every single important site which evolves into a center of the second urbanization has the OCP at its base. So you have it at Rajagriha, you have it at uh, uh, sites like uh, uh, Hastinapura, and so many other sites all have OCP at their base as a Bronze Age culture, followed by a small horizon of the black and red where we see iron for the first time. And then in the Ganga Valley, we start seeing the painted gray ware where urbanization begins, and we roll into the northern black polished ware period somewhere around the 8th century BC where the full-fledged urbanization takes off. And we have a massive urban system coming up. We are bridging the gap between the Harappans and the second urbanization. We are now bringing the first and second urbanizations closer to each other. But does that mean that the OCP people are the people of the Mahabharata or the Ramayana or both? They could be. They could be. But there is no evidence any which way that they are the people of the Mahabharata or the Ramayana. We have no such evidence for them. They are a Bronze Age culture. The Mahabharata and the Ramayana both talk about an Iron Age culture. So to make the people of Sanoli, the Mahabharata Ramayana people, we would then have to discuss the Mahabharata people being a Bronze Age culture as well as an Iron Age culture, establish that before we go anywhere down that road. So we need to take all of this data that is coming to us in context. We need to stop overhyping the data and we need to stop putting the cart before the horse. Very, very much so. We've got some amazing work coming out of Tamil Nadu and it's sadly very badly tainted at the moment. We have a brilliant site called Kizadi or Kiladi, depending on how you pronounce it, I'm from North India or well, Central India, I can't do the correct pronunciation in Tamil, I apologize for that. But in the Vagaya Valley for the first time, we have evidence for urbanization in what would be the Sangama era between the third century BC and the third century AD. And this is massive. This is absolutely massive. But to push it back to the sixth century, because the site starts in the sixth century, but urbanization there is not in the sixth century. So the preliminary reports we're getting from there are very muddled. The fact that the excavator of the site claimed to have been moved away by the ASI because the North didn't want the South to have early urbanization. The site to then be taken over by the Tamil Nadu government, where the Tamil Nadu government this year, I'm told, has been very categoric that only Tamilians must work at a Tamilian site and nobody else. And that any previous person of any other ethnicity are no longer welcome to work on the site, even if they have worked previously at the site. which then smacks of a kind of communalism and a parochiality, which we don't need in India. 
So everything then that comes out of an excavation like this then becomes doubtful in the eyes of the world. And this takes away a phenomenally important site and you know puts it out of the running as something that becomes untouchable. This is something that we have to be very, very, very careful about. For years and years and years, thanks to the Germans and the British, we had an Aryan invasion theory. Till the cows came home, we talked about these Aryans coming down on a, like a wolf on the fold, destroying the forts and Dasyus, pushing the poor Harappans down into southern India and so on and so forth. They were all beautiful narratives. The Harappans did not get pushed down into southern India. There is no evidence of the Harappans or the late Harappans or any kind of Bronze Age in southern India. Southern India goes from a late Neolithic period to a very early and very impressive Iron Age. So instead of talking about this amazing Iron Age phenomena in Southern India, we are too busy talking about the poor beat up Dravidians who were beat up by the Aryans and pushed south. The Dravidians are not poor and not beat up and are a language group. The Aryans are also a language group. They've got nothing to do with any specific ethnicity. This is something that we need to understand. When the data on the ground completely refuted the Aryan invasion theory, we have people talking about the Aryan migration theory. Now, people have been migrating into the Indian subcontinent for, well, since 2.6 million years ago. And there have been wave after wave after wave of migrants. There are probably a hundred plus waves that can be identified and maybe 200 plus waves that can never be identified. But did they replace the people of Northern India? No, they did not. Did their language group replace the language group of Northern India? It appears to be so. Today, we are all speaking in English and we are writing in English in the chat box. That does not make us British of origin or that does not mean that the British have come to India and we've all become British. It just means that the British came and colonized us and now it is the lingua franca of education in most of the world. And this is what we are using today in our discussions. So we have some amazing data coming out, which is being overlooked. For a long time, we've talked about the origins of the Brahmi script. We have the Brahmi script securely dated to Ashoka and a few examples that may or may not be earlier. But now for the first time, from the megalithic graves of southern India, K. Rajan tells us, without any doubt, beautifully carbon dated, he has Brahmi inscriptions dating back to the 5th century BC, most definitely to the 4th century BC. This automatically tells us that Brahmi is much earlier. And yes, it lays open the question that Brahmi might have originated in the south as a script and then gone north. And there is absolutely no problem with that. At the same time, there is an amazing discovery from a site in UP where a poor gentleman digging the foundations for his house on a mound that had been multiply occupied from the late Harappan period onwards, discovered a beautiful copper anthropomorphic figure with the head of a boar and on which there is a unicorn, which is essentially Harappan. And there is also a series of alphabets in a very upraised format that look very much like Harappan alphabets, and some of them look identical with Brahmi alphabets. Could this be a link? It could, but one again is not a set. One is a brilliant opening salvo, and we need to do much more research before we can decide this one way or the other. Linking the Vedas to the Aryan invasion is unnecessary. Understanding where the Vedas were written is perhaps far more important than anything else. Now, We've got iron in Tamil Nadu at 2200 BC, according to the latest report that we have. Now, personally, as an archeologist, I'm completely blown away that there is evidence of a date of 2200 BC for iron anywhere in the world, let alone in India. There are no dates close to that. The earliest dates that I know of from South India would go back to 1400 BC at the most calibrated. To suddenly have a site which is giving us iron from 2200 BC is fabulous, fascinating, and needs much more research. But sadly, it was the chief minister of Tamil Nadu who said, released the news and said, Tamil Nadu had iron at 2200 BC. Now, without doing more work, without checking up on this, 
it is not possible to suddenly go off half cocked. And when the political establishment and Mr. Stalin in this case announces something like this, then it is very difficult for archaeologists to sit and refute it and say, no, Baba, we don't have the data to actually say this is absolute, but it's fascinating and we need to do much, much more work. So iron in South India appears to be earlier at some points than iron in North India, which is fascinating. Iron is definitely linked to horses in Southern India, perhaps also in Northern India, it needs to be looked into in more detail and we need more work before we go off half cocked. Adding to this is some very interesting news that we have from the world of archeology. span We've been told that the site of Hastinapur will be re-excavated by a joint team of the Archaeological Survey of India and other non-government players. And this is fascinating news because this is a site we need to revisit. The 6th century BC cutoff for the, uh, well, for the NBP comes to us from this site because there was a Kushana horizon and an early Kushana horizon. And they were able to date that horizon to roughly about the 1st century AD. And they said on the basis of this, if you've got six feet under it, this must be 600 years. Today, we've realized that that kind of, that they did not have the dating methods that we have and that sites like Hastinampur need to be revisited so that we can absolutely date them and this will become fascinating. Uh, oh, well, other news in this week is that we are going to have a new DG at the ASI and that he is an economist. And I'm seriously looking forward to that announcement being made because as and when that's made, I hope he brings a lot more money into the Archaeological Survey of India because one third of the jobs in the ASI are vacant. The ASI is reeling under a manpower problem. It's very easy to point fingers at the ASI or to State Department uh, of Archaeology and say they are not doing anything. But if they are handicapped by the governments not filling posts, then there is nothing that they can do. So we as a people need to push these things. We as a people need to look at all our archaeology students who are coming out of colleges and courses in archaeology and say there are professionals available. We need to include them and we need to do much more work before urbanization destroys the landscape. I mean, that's part and parcel of what is happening. I mean, you can't stop urbanization, but you can record the data, excavate the data and do the research and not lose forever the data that will be lost with rampant urbanization that is taking place today. So. In the middle of this, we have two people with us here today. We have Sunil, who's been doing some amazing work in mythology and holding a whole series of mythological lectures on a regular basis with people from India and abroad. And throughout the lockdown, he's kept us amazingly informed and entertained with the kind of lectures that he's had. We've also got Shriya Gautam with us, who has an organization called Speaking Archaeologically. Please follow them on Instagram. They work with myriad fields archaeology, anthropology, art, painting, sculpture, architecture, uh, weaving, embroidery, uh, leather working, shoe making, traditionally. So they do some fabulous work. They have a lot of young interns and young archaeologists, archaeologists and anthropologists working with them. And she has been doing some fabulous work. And I think she should take a bow for this very specifically. Throughout the lockdown, there has been only one site which has been consistently excavated by a team, which has diligently worked from before the lockdown and through the lockdown. This is the site of Vadnagar in Gujarat. Abhijit Ambekar and his team have been doing fascinating work there. We now have clearly established the Solanki horizons of the 10th, 11th century AD. We have been able to take Vadnagar from at least the third, fourth century AD, all the way across to the Gujarat Sultanate and the modern era. Vadnagar now has Toranas, it has a Buddhist monastery, it has all kinds of footage, and it has some of the most fascinating artifacts, including some of the most beautiful shell bangles that I have ever seen in my life. It's also got coinage, which is fascinating. And for the first time, we really have a site where we can identify the Maitrakas. The Maitrakas who ruled Gujarat after the collapse of the of the Ashatrapas are a dynasty we know very little about. Their capital was excavated briefly by MS University Baroda, but there was never any publication. I have asked a very senior archaeologist who was a very junior archaeologist at those excavations, 
And he told me, he said he cannot even speak about what went down there and why that site was not excavated further and no publication ever came out of it. So these are the things we need to do. We need to revisit the capitals of the Maitrakas. The capital city was called Vallabhi. It was one of the great universities of India. And we know so little about it. We know that it is the Maitrakas and their allies who kept off the early Islamic invasions of the 7th century and the 6th century, uh, sorry, the 7th century and the 8th century AD. But we know so little about them because we haven't excavated their sites. It's time now to look at them. It's time to look at the early medieval period in a completely new light. And there is work being done very quietly, and very silently by a lot of archaeologists. There are some amazing discoveries in Gujarat that the team at Vatnagar has been making. They've done some work at Taranga, which is absolutely fascinating. They've discovered the only second brick-built independent stupa that we know of from Gujarat. The first is underwater. It was at Devni Mori. It's now under the Shablaji Lake. Uh, it had the relics of the Buddha, and we have the relic at the University Baroda. We also know now that there are very interesting types of rock-cut caves in Gujarat, where the caves haven't been cut, where natural caves have been used, and walls have been added to them of masonry. So this is something that we've seen in a lot of sites of the later Buddhist period in Sri Lanka. And for the first time, we are seeing things like that in India, which we have been able to identify as Buddhist monastic sites. So there is some fabulous work coming out. And I definitely think Abhijit Ambedkar and his team need to take a bow for the kind of stuff that they're putting out to us. Uh, the India Study Center Trust carried out excavations at the site of Mandad in 2019. This was back to back with our paper in 2018, where we said that we were identifying Mandad and the nearby Kuda caves as the site of Mandagora. And that Mandad Kuda was, you know, uh, translated by the Greeks as Mandagora. And the gur gur sound interchange is something that linguists will be able to verify very easily. We've excavated there, and the results that we have from our very small excavations with limited budgets are absolutely mind blowing. So here, for the first time, I'm really officially putting it out to say that not only do we have an Indo-Roman period site, we have one beautiful amphora base. We have a bead that is definitely of, we believe, of Roman origin. But apart from that, apart from it being a port and having links to the Romans, what is most fascinating is that for more than a meter below the Roman occupation, we have a much earlier occupation on the top of which we have the southernmost northern black polished ware in Western India. For the first time, we have northern black polished ware in Western India, south of the Supara region. It might just be 120 kilometers south, but it is huge because we are extending the lines. The northern black polished ware, as we know, ends in the Maurya Shunga period, as it's called. By the second century BC, the northern black polished ware has disappeared. So it tells us that there is a 2nd century BC port site in the Raigad district of Maharashtra for the first time. And this is way before there is any Indo-Roman trade. And is probably, in all possibility, if international in any way, this is trade with the Greco-Egyptians or the Ptolemids, because we know that in the 3rd century BC, the Ptolemids are sending ships to India, though in small numbers, nothing like what we see in the 1st century AD. We've also got some other evidence that is coming to us of coarse wares that are parallel to the Northern Black Polished Ware coming to us from Mandar. And coarse wares are something that are usually not transported across massive distances. These ceramics from the Ganga Valley, whereas table wares like Northern Black Polished Ware can easily travel in small numbers. For large numbers of coarse wares to travel to the West Coast of India, tells us that the site of Mandat is a critically important site to understand the pre-Indo-Roman era port sites of Western India, most probably engaged in a lot of local traffic, not necessarily international traffic. So this is something that we need to look at again in more detail. I hope to finish my publication of the first season's excavations this year and apply for the 2023-24 excavation season to the Archaeological Survey of India and pray that they will grant me the request of continuing the excavations there. We've had some lovely help 
from a lot of people in doing this. And it, I could go on for half an hour just acknowledging all of them. But I must acknowledge the Department of Archaeology and Museums. Dr. Tejas Garge and his team, uh, Harshada Virpur and others have really helped us. Uh, Dr. Abhijit Dandekar, currently the registrar at Deccan College, is my ceramist always. And he's done some yeoman service in identifying a lot of the materials we have. We will probably be able to talk in greater detail about the black and red way of the early historic period in Western India, thanks to these excavations. And these are tiny excavations. We have two trenches of two meters by two meters, of which only one is an early historical trench. The other is a medieval and early medieval trench. So the possibilities are phenomenal, and we hope to do more work here, and we hope to get things done in a greater manner. There are a lot of great mysteries in archaeology, which Indian archaeologists and historians need to look into, and they look into as part of international teams. There is the simple fact that we have peppercorns in the nostrils of the mummy of Ramesses II, and he died in 1213 BC. We have no clue what is going on in the 13th century BC in peninsular India, and who could be trading these peppercorns, most definitely by sea, because sending peppercorns from Kerala over land to Egypt would have been ridiculous. And in the 13th century BC, who is there in Kerala to do this is a question we need to answer. Because those peppercorns are there, they're Narcissus nostrils, and he's probably been sneezing for the last 3,300 years up somewhere in heaven or hell or wherever the poor man is. The question of the Brahmi script I've already discussed with you is something that look needs a lot more research. We have a phenomenal kind of artifact called the Indo-Pacific bead. These are really tiny three millimeter diameter annular beads that are made in India and found all over the Bay of Bengal, West Asia, sorry, Southeast Asia, Taiwan, Korea, and all the way to Japan. Lots of archeologists have worked from India and abroad independently in verifying this, this now needs to be brought together. What the late Peter Francis was talking about seems to be more and more of a reality. What is fascinating is these beads are leaving the east coast of India as early as the 5th century BC and going to Vietnam and going to Thailand. Now, again, in the 5th century BC, who is there in southern India that is trading across the seas? There is a very, very intriguing art article by a Korean archaeometallurgist and Dr. Vasan Shinde, where he's, the Korean archaeometallurgist says that the method of making iron and iron tools in Korea does not follow the technological manner in which Chinese iron tools are made during the corresponding period, but surprisingly is identical to what we see in the Vidarbha megalithic between five to 800 years earlier. So this tells us that in the 8th century BC and the 5th century BC, the techniques of the Vidarbha megalithic and the technology of the Vidarbha megalithic is now being replicated by ironsmiths in Korea in the 1st century BC. It appears to show some kind of transfer of technology from India to Korea 2100 years ago. And this again is a question that needs some very, very serious answering. We need to know what kind of Indian sailors were living in these early centuries between the 5th century BC and the 1st century BC and traveling all the way to Japan and Korea. And this is something that, again, needs a lot more analysis than has been put into place and a lot more research. Iron and the horse is another great problem. How did iron and the horse come to India? Why did iron and the horse come to India? Again, much more work needs to be done. We talk about Indo-Roman trade. We're now talking about trade with Korea and Japan. But what about trade with our neighbors, the Achaemenids? What about trade with the Parthians? What about trade with the Sassanids? What was the mass that was Persia doing vis-a-vis -vis India? And what kind of trade was there? And what kind of archaeological evidences do we have? And what do we need to look for? So at the Sanjan excavations, we've talked about what kind of Sassanid material we can expect to find. And we have about 28 or 30 different sites now, which are of the early medieval period, thanks to the profile that we've generated from Sanjar. But we need much more. Museums today are having all kinds of very, very interesting things happening to them, but some not very interesting things. A lot of museums are opening up new galleries. 
a lot of museums are interacting in huge ways with the public. We have a brilliant children's museum where the objects in the children's museum were curated by children at the Chhatrapati Shivaji Maharaj Vastu Sangrale. Now, this kind of initiative is huge and needs to be replicated. And Dr. Sabisachi Mukherjee and his team deserve major kudos for doing this kind of work. I hear that there is a very exciting new gallery coming up at the CSMBS, and I'm really looking forward to that project also and the fruition of that project by the CSMBS. There are new museums coming up all over the country. Bihar is seeing a Champaran Gandhi Museum. There have been two or three very, very interesting museums like the Khalsa Museum and others in Punjab. I'm told that there is there are a spate of new museums coming up across the country. And this is good because it will help museologists, archaeologists, and researchers in archaeology history and museology in the coming years and will give them jobs more than anything else, which is a crying need today. There is the National Maritime Heritage Museum coming up in Gujarat. And that ultimately when it's going to happen one piece at a time, but when that happens, that's going to be phenomenal also. But, 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 students who are researching things have terrible problems approaching museums. Museums are not happy to give access to their reserve collections to students. And students face all kinds of problems, not just students, but even senior researchers has stonewalled regularly by museums. I'm not saying all museums are doing this, but many, many museums, the bulk of them are guilty of this. And this is something that we also have to look at. I regularly get asked about the Harappan script and it being deciphered. The Harappan script is not being deciphered at all. I know of at least 25 different people that I can tell you who have deciphered the Harappan script. It is everything from Tamil to early Sanskrit to Gondi to Marathi and so on and so forth. Uh, we need to take a lot of this with a big pinch of salt, pepper, and some garam masala and some chaat masala thrown on top. The situation of the Harappan script is such that the body of the Harappan script that we have just now is not in any way conducive to decipherment. Will it happen in the future? I really hope so. At the moment, the data that we have does not allow us to reach any remote conclusions whatsoever on what the script was saying, what the language was, we do not know. For example, the Dholavira board, which Rekha Rao is talking about, would have been a proper noun. It would have been the name of the city of Dholavira, and it would have been beyond language, most probably. So how will you know what language to apply and to read that language via the Harappan script? So first we need to identify the language of the Harappans. Would they have been just one language for a 3 million square kilometer community at its height? Would they have all spoken one language? Would the use of the characters be the same always? These are major questions that we need to ask and we need to very, very, very seriously look at things. So, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not going to take up more time. I think I'm about one hour into what I was saying. I'm going to try and answer questions. Uh, please ask as many questions as you can. If there is something like you'd like to add, please put that in also. I will be very, very happy to answer those questions. Uh, Abhudaya says, the upper two stories of the Qutub Minar are clearly different from the lower ones. Yes, they were added by Ferusha Tughlaq after there was a fire which destroyed the wooden upper stories of the Qutub Minar. Diptan asks, uh, uh, Sir, is it true that in Lanka a map of Ravan was found which could open a portal into space? No, Diptan. I'm sorry, there is no such thing. That is the stuff of very good Bollywood movies or science fiction novels, but is not sadly in any way real. There is no portal that opens into space anywhere. Forget about Ravens. Uh, I have already talked about the Aryan invasion. Uh, Nikhil, so you will have to excuse me for overlooking your question. Avir says, many historians may present more religious-based works. Was this a strategy of religious warfare? Was it actually based on an idea of evidence? This Avir will take an entire session of at least 10 lectures to go through. And it's a Brilliant idea. Maybe we should do a series of lectures of this. Yadesh says, Sir, how was the lost city of Zikhihu? Can you help us understanding ancient history? I can 
help you understand ancient history, Adesh, but I have never heard of the city of Zikihu. Now, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It just means that I do not know about it. I will definitely ask Riddhi and Yogini to write down this Zikihu and look at it. And if I can find anything about it that I can help you with, I will be happy to put it on the WhatsApp group. Prachi Kailka says, why do you think the script of the Harappans has been so difficult to decipher? Okay, now that Prachi has asked this, we find Harappan inscriptions with these characters on them. We don't know whether this is an Abu Gida, an ABCD. We don't know whether this is a pictographic script like hieroglyphics. We don't know if it's logographic like Chinese. We don't know if it's a mishmash of these or whether it is something completely new. There are over 400 symbols that we know. In Chinese, there are over 3,000 symbols. So it doesn't meet that requirement. A good Abu Gida has about maybe 30, 40 uh, symbols at the most. These are too many for that also. There are a lot of composite symbols. These symbols exist in a period of time that is at least, okay, at least 700 years from 2600 to 1900 BC and probably earlier and later. So it's definitely going to change in a period of, well, 700 years. And we don't know which of the alphabets come from which dates precisely. So in this kind of situation with uh, inscriptions of basically three to seven alphabets, that's the range. Uh, there is one which is about 22 alphabets. There are two which I think 14 or 11, but the bulk of them are between three and seven. It is impossible to create any syntax or anything whatsoever. We mainly find them on seals and we mainly find them inscribed on potsherds, which means that these are probably proper nouns. On a seal, you would put your name or your company's name or your location or all of these, all proper nouns. With just proper nouns, you cannot decipher anything. On pottery, when we find scratched in inscriptions, they're inscriptions of identifying that this is your pot. We see a lot of this in early Brahmi inscriptions, and we have a couple of these from as far away as Berenike and Mios Hormos at the you know, end of the Red Sea, where we were trading during the Indo-Roman period. So they always have a name belonging to, so Kuvir Attan is, a, is one of the examples I can give you of Kuvir. This is Kuvir's pot. Okay. So this automatically means that we are only working with proper nouns. Now, where we can understand Tamil and we can decipher this is one thing as a proper noun and a name and what it is. Not knowing the language, not knowing what we're looking at, to try and decipher it is madness. So, Praji, that is the answer for that. Adesh says, if you can put your views on Sinoli excavation. Uh, yes, I have already uh, done dealt with that. Adesh, thank you for asking that. Anirudh says, a pressing question, sir. Why is there an obsession with large urban civilizations to claim ancestry form and pass off a nation's origin from such cultures? Anirudh, I cannot answer that question because I honestly don't know what the madness for this is. I suppose it is European and the Europeans seeing their antecedents in the Greco-Roman civilizations. And perhaps this is where it comes to us from, but I really can't pinpoint this. This is out, way outside my field. Anupriya Kanti says, how much of the often misconstrued revisionist narrative contesting generally agreed and fact-based history, be it nationalist, out of India theory, contesting current Aryan migration theory, or pushing back dates of Vedas to 15,000 years over the evidence of it being within the first million of BC can be attributed to malicious intentions of powers to be, and how much can be attributed to misunderstanding? So whether it is attributed to powers to be or not, it is still misunderstanding. So Anupriya, that, is, that, that wicket is already down. Uh, is it done maliciously by some people? Yes. And I will tell you that there are Buddhists who do this, Jains who do this, Hindus who do this, Christians who do this. I don't know any Zoroastrians who are actively doing this, but I'm sure they're doing it. I know Muslims who are doing it. So across the board, we are trying to say things that aren't there. We are trying to deny things that have happened. And we are trying to see things out of context. Instead of understanding phenomena in the time period in which they take place, we use the morals of today to judge yesterday. And that is something that you cannot do. You cannot judge yesterday on the basis of today. The American Indians thought that somebody who was a good thief, who could steal horses from another tribe, was a great hero. Today, if you think the great thief is a great hero, there's something wrong with you. 
but you have to look at the conditions that existed then, the circumstances that existed then, and the kind of society that was built up then. At one time, we thought that women immolating themselves in the pyres of their husbands was a truly noble thing to do. Today, we know that it is a ghastly thing to do. But you cannot judge those who perform sati in the past by today's morals. Please understand this. You have to understand it in its context. And this Anupriya is something that we are refusing to do across the board, across faiths. And remember, it's always pseudo-historians and revisionists who shout loudly. The common man does not shout loudly and then gets led by this little ring that is in all our noses by people like this. Riddhi Joshi says, could you kindly repeat the name of the site where the individual found the copper anthropomorphic figure with the head of the core? Uh, I have an article in Live History India called Metal Men of the Doab. Just look it up and that it's there. I think it's uh, Khejri Gujjar or Khetri Gujjar, which is the name of the site or something like that. The first name I'm not getting exactly right. Okay. In Haryana. Gautam says, where can we see the image of this Gopa artifact with Harappan Brahmi joint script? I'm not saying it's Harappan Brahmi. I'm saying the characters look Harappan and they look like Brahmi. What they are is a mystery. Uh, again, Metal Men of the Doab is an article that I've written on the Live History India portal. You can see it there. It has been published by Manjul and Manjul. And it is the published artifact in Pragdhara. There is absolutely no heavy caviness about it. I know people who were present there when it was analyzed. And it is definitely the real thing. Now, again, it is one and one is not a set of anything. Okay. So, Neil, don't say thank you. You're doing a fabulous job. Avir says, sir, when we do a periodic revision of history, we may notice a few subtle or eye-catching changes need to be made. Won't this create a sense of dissatisfaction amongst those who truly believe in the old system? Uh, Avir, just take an example from science. When I went to school, there were nine planets. Today, there are eight. Pluto is not a planet. Is it going to destroy me? No. So similarly, when you realize that something is wrong and something wrong has been taught, you rectify that. Okay. Uh, Shubhra says, uh, great pleasure as always to listen to you. Kurush would like to know what prevents archaeological research from being incorporated into mainstream curricula. Why are we using textbooks that are 60 years old? This is very, very much because archaeologists live in ivory towers, publish their material, which is only accessible to other archaeologists more than anything else. And because archaeologists and historians have had a great distancing between them. And whereas archaeology cannot become a subject in school, it would be part of the history textbooks. And we need to engage with more historians. We need to make this data available to the people who write textbooks. And these things need to be done and they cost money to do because people have to be hired to do this put this database together, it's always so much easier to not add new things and just publish the same old thing. Avir says, how will the social stability of our country being affected? Avir, I think the social stability of our country is in a very, very elastic state at the moment and is not doing well at all. Anand says, it is curious case about Wallabi. We only hear about the Shila and Nalanda. As you said, we need some more intent and work. By the way, there is a Fabulous excavation going on in Bihar at a site called Telhara. I forgot to mention it. Really amazing stuff coming out of there. It looks like Telhara is actually the monastery that probably was destroyed uh, by Bhaktiar Khilji and not Nalanda. Because Nalanda really doesn't give us the stuff that Telhara is giving us. And there's some absolutely amazing work happening over there in Bihar. There's the Bihar Museum, which is a beautifully revamped museum also. And I would, well... Didarganj Yakshi was on my bucket list and I was lucky enough to see her before she moved out of the Patna Museum. But the Bihar Museum is definitely on my bucket list to go and visit because it's a beautifully made modern museum. Uh, for some question, ask them, join us on the 17th, says Mugda ma'am, definitely. Do come and join us on the 17th. I will be talking in more depth on some of these matters that I've touched upon today. Uh, Kanchan Jadav, as much as I would like to believe that Rekha Rao has deciphered the signboard, I am sorry, but Rekha Rao thinks she has deciphered the signboard. She has not done so. You cannot use the technique of Rekha Rao if you apply it yourself on other things. So when you have a decipherment technique, which only you can use and nobody else can use, 
then there is something very, very wrong with it. So I wish uh, Ms. Ms. Rao all the very best. And if she does manage to crack the Harappan script, that will be great laurels and great kudos for her. And she will be a great persona in history, archaeology, linguistics, epigraphy, etc. But at this point, the data does not point out to this at all. I'm sorry to put it this way. If there are any other questions and anybody would like to raise their hands or say anything, I would be very, very happy to have them there. Uh, will the uh, team please make it possible for people to put on their cameras and unmute themselves and ask their questions? Please put up your hand. You call what out your name. View it on the WhatsApp group. Okay. Because they might digest something and uh, you know come come. So with... let's let's take one or two questions, ma'am. Right. Ashley DeMello has his hand up. Let's listen to Ashley, please. Ashley, please speak. Unmute yourself. Mm -hmm. Hello, can you hear yes. me? Yes, yeah. yes, no, I, I want to know. You were talking of there's this generally uh, uh, deluge of articles which are right wing aimed at the the, the secular fabric of, of history writing, and the, it's been talked about for several years now. How long do you think it's going to last? Are the are the, the level headed middle ground people going to lose out, or is there going to be another change a few years down the line? See the, uh, opinion. Yeah. the level headed middle ground people normally are like the Jesuits. They take the long view of things when things automatically realign themselves. We need people who are extremists to challenge extremists. And till that does not happen, uh, Ashley, uh, I don't think there is much going to happen here. Uh, we'll take one more question. This is from Chakradhar Chakri. Uh, please unmute yourself, and that'll be the second question. And uh, then those of you all who are interested can take it to the WhatsApp group or come on the 17th to the meet and greet with Pinstosen, and we'll be very, very happy to see you there. In fact, we really hope a lot of you all actually come there and join us. Yes, uh, please. Hi, Kurush. Yeah. Uh, why, why we couldn't able to uh, find any archaeological evidence of the horse in the Indian subcontinent? So we have archaeological evidence. We have a lot of archaeological evidence that tells us that in Vidarbha and in peninsular India, that is in Andhra Pradesh, Tamil Nadu, Karnataka, and uh, probably from Kerala, but I can't remember anything from Kerala often, there is lots of evidence of Iron Age burials of horses, etc. In northern India, we know that from the painted greyware period onwards, there are horses. Again, alongside iron, but iron has come a little earlier. There are some people who believe that there were a few horses during the Harappan period. There are others who refute this. There are a lot of arguments this way and that way. It is just that there isn't enough data from an earlier period from Northern India. So the Vedas very specifically talk to us about horses and they talk to us, we feel about iron and that the metal called ayas is actually iron. But they actually talk about two ayas. They talk about ayas and Krishna ayas. So if Krishna Ayaz is black metal versus Ayaz. Then the Ayaz could then be copper bronze, which would then mean that the Rig Veda was written at a transition between the Bronze Age and the Iron Age. That leaves a whole set of, you know, worms out of the can. Uh, are we willing to accept that? We need to ask these questions. Uh, I really, really don't know why we don't have better evidence of horses, but we need more work for that more than anything else. It's not uh, that evidence is going to suddenly be waiting for us in a package saying, here is your gift wrap package for you. We have to do much more work. We need much more excavation. We need careful excavations and we need analysis of the databases and we need publication. Who knows where there is a you know, an unanalyzed database of an excavation report sitting where all this data is actually sitting and waiting to be revealed to the world. So on that happy note, guys, thank you very much to all of you all for being here and listening to us and, you know, being such a, such a fascinating group of people. Thank you again to all of you all. Thank you to the Instrucent Trust, Yogini, um, and Riddhi and Anirudh, thank you very much for running this. Thank you very much, Mukta, ma'am. 
all of you all who've been listening to us, thank you very, very much for being here. And we look forward to seeing many, many more of you on the meet and greet on the 17th. So we will share the link for that on the WhatsApp group. And if there are more questions, put them on the WhatsApp group. And as and when I can, I will answer them. And there was that one question about that very interesting site. I have asked uh, Yogini and Riddhi to make a note of that location. And if I can find something about it, I will do so. Thank you very, very much. And good night. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Hope to see you. Thank you.